I'm going to pass the component, before I speak about it, I'm going to pass each component around. So this is going to come around right now. These are MC4 cable ends. Okay? This is a very standard uh, cable for dealing with solar. And this is what I always put on customers' panels, uh, or when I'm wiring the panels, over it to protect the cable. This is a uh, wire loom. It's a good thing to have around three-quarter wire loom is what you want to use for solar. I'm going to go ahead and get that started so that everybody can get their hands on some stuff while I do introduction. First off, this is Tony Jones. This is the gentleman I use to give my parts for installs that I do for customers. My name is Lucas Cameron. For those of you that follow Seven Trumpets Prepper on YouTube, uh, many of you know me by that. Uh, hopefully, many of you will get to know me by this now. It's off-grid contracting. You want off-grid solar, off-grid wind, hydropower, off-grid water, heating, aquaponics. I mean, we're going to do it all. Um, I'm pretty booked up right now. But starting next month, I've got open slots. You're going to see a bunch of installs on the YouTube. If you don't mind me YouTubing your install, I'm willing to give people discounts on installs nowadays. I will beat anybody's price on installing solar. I do it for 75 cents a watt. If you find somebody that does that cheaper, let me know. I'll be done. Okay? All right, so we're going to get started. And the first thing I'm going to go over is solar. I'm going to take you step by step, piece by piece, how to do this. Then we're going to change over to wind power. Then I'm going to have Tony at the very end go over some things that are really critical like MPPT controllers and why a surcharge controller is better than the other one. Because, it, you know, it's one thing to hear from me, but to hear from an actual industry <coughs> professional, it'll be clear as mud, okay? Now, <laughs> all right, now this is important to have. This is the other thing I want to pass around before we get started. This is a DC multimeter. All right, you go to the store and buy one of those $10 multimeters or whatever at Lowe's or something like that. You're just going to blow it up. It's only good for about 10 amps of DC. Right. So this right here is the type of meter that you're going to want to have. Is that a charge? No, that one's actually, I think, from our friends in China. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so anyway, you can check us out at offgridcontracting.com. And uh, you can reach me there. Um, our email is going to be the way it's uh, looking right now. It's going to be go off grid at offgridcontracting.com. In, in the meantime, you can catch me at Seven Trumps Prepper Gmail. So today we're going to uh, we're presenting to you how to wire wind and solar. A basic introduction. Okay. Now to begin with, you're going to have a disconnect box. This is always for your safety. And should you ever want to go to sell power to an electric company. Many electric companies require you to have a load lockout box, a lockable box outside that they can come over and say, hey, you know what, you can't sell me service no more. We're going to yank your stuff and lock you down. So the point of having that, though, for your safety is should you ever want to go and maintenance your equipment, uh, this is uh, a $6 part. You can get it Lowe's. All right? Now, the way this works, is you just simply pull the plug out of it and you've disconnected your power. All right? Now you're going to see this on the screen in a minute, but right there there's two terminal leads. You put your hot in, you put your ground in. This is an AC disconnect box, <coughs> but you can use it for DC. Don't ever use DC for AC or fireworks will happen. Okay? Now, like I said, that's just for cutting the power system off. And what you can do is once you flip flop this, it says on or off. Okay? You've got it on, and you push that in there, that will connect your system. Those two bars will come together and let power pass. And I'll show you that right here on the screen. So everything representative on the screen here, hot is going to be red, and negative is going to be black. Okay? So that's that box I just am passing around right now. I'm going to try to take my time, but I know we got to go a little long. we got a 10 minute late start. Is that the power is going to come in from your solar panels? Look at our solar panel look to here. <coughs> so this is a solar panel. All right, this is a polycrystalline. If you've seen the video I've done on the channel lately, I uh, went over monocrystallines, polys, thin films, all the differences for using these. This is a 12 volt. Um, Tony has uh, a versatile range of charge controllers, all voltages, if you like 24, he's got that too. This right here is 24 volt, okay? So there's a lot of different versatility in the charge controllers, we'll get into that in a minute. But this one here, I like to live in 12 volt land because everybody understands the hot and the ground, and that's it. It's just like car battery. This right here, you're going to start from there, coming in through that disconnect box, just like so. 
Any questions so far? Does EMP bother panels? You know, everybody asks about that. I don't know. You know, I, what, what I, the, re, the thing I've been trying to do to figure out to get around that is I think thermal power and hydropower is the best thing that you can have. Because when the water's always moving, you always got power. If you make heat, you've got power from thermal. But solar, you know, I think if your panels got fried, you're probably toast without, you know, that's pretty much what I tell everybody, just to be safe. But is there any electronic components in that? Well, you know, aside from the semiconductor thing and the panel, the, the diode is really it. I mean, just, you know, what, what happens is whenever you have an open system like, like thermal modules, if you're not pushing power out, they're pulling power back out of the battery bank. And that's the only safety check you have in that place. You see what I'm saying? So you're discharging. I just think the best thing to do, like I said, in a case like that, you worry about EMP, is thermal or hydro. Now the next step we're going to get to here is once you've got a disconnect, if a charge controller doesn't have a fuse in the system, you're going to want to have a fuse in line to protect your charge controller just in case of a power surge. But with that said, this particular charge controller, you can find it at hurricanewindpower.com. Tony's cards are out here on the table as well. This one is a 24 volt but they have one that's 12 volt also, same styling and everything. So as we pass this around, take very special care to look at the markings on this because that's exactly how I have it demonstrated on the board off this exact charge controller, okay? Because it's very simple and user friendly. You have a battery input, ground and hot. You have your solar input. You even have three phase wind input so that you don't have to rectify those three wires. And we'll get into that in a minute. It's got the jump load. I mean, everything's marked off crystal clear, it's digital, it's a whole nine yards in the future right there. So I'll pass that around as we're starting to talk about the charge control. Make sure to look at the leads. It also has an input port where you can track it on the, with a computer. How many watts is that small controller there? 400 solar and 1200 wind. Yeah, that's a hybrid controller that we've got because we've got a lot of people that want wind and solar and they wanted to put it together in one controller. So rather than the other type of controller that he has over there, which is there's something called pulse width modulation, that's a dump load controller. So what that does is after the that hooks up directly to a battery bank. And when the battery bank exceeds a voltage or what's called a set point, the power opens up and you have to have something such as the PCS back here, and the power goes to that, it bleeds off the excess power. And really, you don't have to have that charge controller on the battery bank to make it work. What that charge controller, what that diversion load controller does, is it allows you to walk away from your system and leave it without worrying about it overcharging. That other controller that we passed around does all kinds of smart things that the other controller does not. Um, it has three phase while AC is what the wind turbine is. The wind turbine um, has three wires, all three of them are hot. And it also has, so it, it'll take the thousand watts from that. It will boost. Um, the control so you can start charging batteries at lower wind speed and then it's got 400 watts of solar so you, you, you can get both of those together so there's there's mixtures of charge controllers and it probably take me 10 minutes to explain if we have time at the end I can talk about this all day but I want to let Luke yeah, and I definitely want Tony to talk against about charge controllers because you can't just slap anything on the wall, okay? It's very important that you do stuff right when you do it, okay? This panel that you have right here sitting in front, how many watts is that? That's a 100 watt panel. That's a 100 watt panel? Yeah, you get these at Hurricane Wind Power as well. Um, now, I tried to think this through as, um, you know, as simplistic as possible for, I mean, somebody that has nothing to know about solar after you insulate it out if you have a PhD in it. I mean, literally, we want to make this as simple as possible. One, two, three. Some charge controllers require you to wire the dump load first, then the battery bank, and then the solar panels. Now, I got an install do it for a customer this week, finishing up the camper for them. Their charge controller requires that because the dump load has to be in place effective first. 
then the battery bank to register to the charge controller because it's just like a grid tie inverter. You can't sell power to an electric company unless it reads that there's power in an electric company because you don't want to electrocute somebody alive. All right, and then lastly, then you'll connect your solar. But now with this particular layout here, we're going to do this. Uh, the way that you get around this is if you want to do it one, two, three, like I'm doing right now, is you would connect these last two leads at night when your system's not running. Okay? It's dark. All right, so there's no power feeding through. So the first step of the way in that charge controller coming around, and I was, where's the charge controller at right now? Okay, all right, okay. I'm going to take my time with this before we go to the next slide. I want everybody to see that first. Is that you have these two leads coming in. So after we've gotten the disconnect in place, and like I said, if it doesn't have a fuse in your control or your charge controller module, you want to make sure to have an inline fuse. It's just for safety. All right, that's like a five dollar fix at AutoZone. Right here, once you have that power coming in, then in step one, you're going to be ready to distribute that and through the charge controller. We're going to go through step two and step three here in just a second. Where's that charge controller? All right, well, all that is uh, what we're doing now. These are some examples of dump loads. Um, the, if anybody's seen the tiny house build install that I just done for Randy, his tiny house company, we went with DC load to the water heater dump. I think that's the best option ever because our water heating bill is 20% of our house's bill. If you have um, a solar system on your home right now, I totally advise you to change one of the water heating elements if you have a large water heating tank. You notice that you've got an element at the top and an element at the bottom. I'd leave the AC element at the bottom, and I'd change the top one to a DC element and dump load your dump into that. And that way, during the day when you're not using it, it's dumping to it, and you're getting hot water. And then when it does get dark at night, if you do want to heat up your water, you still got AC running to it. And it has a temperature module in the, the water heat. And you can see that in that field video that I've done. Uh, they make those with an adjustable dial, too. So you can run it up, I think it's 190 degrees on your water. That's Pretty good, pretty good and warm. This is resistors. This one right here is a module from Hurricane Wind Power. That is enough uh, resistance right there to dump off this right here because this is a boss. All right, that, that can make up uh, at least over 1kW of power. So these right here are 300 watts apiece. So as you can see, you need a bank of those for the dump. So you always need to match up. You know, whatever you got coming in, you need to have somewhere for it to go. I got a question now. With uh, the solar be okay with a uh, geothermal unit? Geothermal, what, what capacity? What are we talking about? What is it, AC or heat? Okay, so I mean, geothermal, when you say geothermal, I think can about. You hook up, can you hook up? Well, we have to have power serving the uh, power arm that operates the water from the <coughs> geothermal. So we're to have the power from it. Uh, well, I mean, honestly, I don't, you know, I know what geothermal means, I know what we're talking about, but I don't, I don't know what we're talking about. You'd have to look at the specs on the unit, because all that stuff varies. It's just like heating and air and everything, I mean, that's, that's one of those if, if of the unit and what you're talking about goes in and it runs off 110, we can take electrical um, grid ties and things like that to make it, make it interface, but... Get with me after, and we'll talk about it. I, I can figure out what you're talking about. Can you take a minute? Okay. All right. Now, next is the second step is you're going to wire your battery. Now, I put a little yellow block here because I'm fond of the Optima yellow top batteries. You can abuse them. You can reuse them and abuse them again. My dad, if you notice noticed, uh, the wind turbine install that I done on the farm a couple years ago was up on the channel. Um, I have a table there for his battery bag. What we do with one of the Optima batteries is we just take it off there and use it on his tractor. And when he runs dead, we just bring it back in, hook it up again, repeat the cycle of abuse. It never lets it down. Just fires right up. So that's that's a great battery to use. Um, in a tiny house build, me and Randy decided to go with Trojan batteries. They're great for golf carts, great for tiny homes, great for backup power. So that's. That's another option. The only thing with Trojan batteries here in East Tennessee is if you buy them at the golf cart places, you'll find that a 12 volt battery is about a Benjamin Franklin mower. When you start doing that, 
Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Tony gets you charged with the batteries. I'm all about that. I didn't know that, sir. Well, uh, anyway, well, Tony can verify what I'm saying then. Is if you buy a 12 volt battery, and I just found this out recently because we've started crunching the numbers trying to say the new owner of the tiny house as much money as possible, give them a cheap solar system to put them. And um, the, if you buy a 12 volt Trojan battery, it's about $100 more when you add the math on the amp hours and everything you're going to get out of it, as opposed to you buy two 6 volt batteries. And you wire them together in series, which is another subject for another time, so we're just going to stay on 12 volt today. But if you wire those together in series, you, for taking five minutes of your time and tightening down four nuts and a couple wires, you save the hundred dollar bill. So it's a pretty good thing. We just found that out the other day on the job side. Okay, so step three is the dump load. Where's the dump loads at right now in the room? The back there. Okay. So when those dump loads get around to you, you'll see right here you've got your leads coming in. You've got a hot ground. And depending on the dump load that you have in place, um, you just wire it as so. They're all the same. You've got the terminals marked. A great thing to do with this, and we've done this with that tiny house build as well, is that we went ahead and ran the dump to it. And then I wired for Randy a ground and a hot off of it. And we put a switch in place. <coughs> and a great switch to use is these marine switches because deal with being around moisture. You can get those at Bass Pro Shops. By all means, please shop there. I do work there part-time on the bench. So um, when, you, when you wire that in, and you can flip that on and on, and um, that way you have the luxury of that when it's dark at night, and you've already dumped during the day, but now your water's starting to cool off, you just flip that switch on for a few minutes, let it heat up, and then go in there and have your scalding hot shower because my wife gets on to me, I, I have to have about a 200 degree shower, you know, I'm cold right down here. So anyway, that is that is a good option you can put in place here, and all you do is bring you a ground off in a pot, and all you got to do is just hook the switch in. That's it, just additional two wires. Do you need a relay or anything like that? How, how much does that drop? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it, it varies on, like, the uh, the one I put in the tiny house is 250 watt, and um, the <coughs> one put around the room there is 300 watt. So that's that's the draw on it. Um, the little storage. Is, is the dump load a necessity for the system? I mean, will it operate without it, or is that just a way of trying not to waste anything? And when we get to wind power in a minute, in my opinion, it's an absolute necessity. I've got a solution for that that I use on the farm. I'll show you in a minute. But when it comes to solar, I mean, it's, unless you have a really large system, you know, I mean, you don't really have to. But my thought process is you're going to be out 20% on your water here. For 30 bucks, you get you, you know, that element, and you're saving a ton of money, I and mean, it's paying for itself. And at the end of the year, make Uncle Sam give you 30% back, you know, and work your labor up, too. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. So, anyway, uh, next off is you're going to come off your battery bank. Terrible personal word, right? Thank you. Is, uh, you're going to come off your battery bank at this point. You've got to the finish line. You've got your dumps in place so that your system is protected. Yeah, I'm going to pass the beater first. This is what I call the beater. This is the Harbor Freight Special. Um, I've used it at the house a multitude of times when, uh, in my days. When the power's out of the house, because uh, our electric service is terrible, I just go in there and flick it on, and we can have light and whatever we want. I don't run free for lows. I only have 2,000 watt uh, set up, uh, and that's it. And that right there, it'll get you through with uh, with lighting and things, but it's a modified sine wave converter, okay? So you cannot have used that. Now, on the flip side of that, and I'm, I'm going to start passing stuff around backwards. That way we got stuff on both sides. This right here, you can get this hurricane wind power. This is epic. Uh, I did a 2,000 watt one uh, the other day. It's a push button. You can literally go in the guy's camper now and push button. Everything's completely off grid. Um, this one right here is 1500 watt, so you're almost on the same level of that. But the surge load, I mean, it can handle up to uh, 3000, but this right here is a 24 volt one, but you can get this in 12 as well. Um, and right there's your inputs. So what we're looking at here is the ground, we're going to come straight off our battery bank, and then we're also going to come with our hot lead off the battery bank. Now I also encourage you to put a fuse in line with that too, okay? Five dollars to protect your five hundred dollars. Small investment, good security. We all buy insurance. Okay. Yes, sir. How big a key? Um, 
60 amp is probably overkill. But, uh, I mean, that's what I put on the one at the house. I think, I, matter of fact, I think the one in the wind turbine install might be an 80 amp. But they have these ones that you can just screw to the wall, and it's a push-button drop. Literally, you push the button on it, and the fuse just drops down. And then you just snap the little red clip back in. You can see that video. I'll put a link in the Mount Preppers Expo video I'm doing right now. I'll put a link in there where you can see the tiny house install, see the camper install, and you can see the wind turbine so that you can see all these components I'm referring to. You can go through and review that and see these items. If, you, if you're ever trying to figure out for any of this stuff what, what it is that you need to put in mind, you take the battery bank environment that you work on, so you take 12, 24, 40 gigs. If it's a 3,000 watt inverter, you divide 12 into 3,000 and you figure out how many amps might be going through, and then you go with something above that. You've got 24, it's 1,500. You divide that in there, and that's, that's how many amps. So volts times amps equals watts. And then you can take that backwards, and that's how you size what you need. But in the ballpark of most people's installs and stuff, in like five, six hundred watt range, you know, a lot of people keep it kind of that work, 60 amp or 80 amp breaker, you know, just a little wall push out. It'll be, it'll be just fine. That there is a different world. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to pause for just a second with the solder before we go on from the wind. And just a review here, we have our disconnect box. We're going to come into our charge controller. If it doesn't have a fuse marked in the instruction manual with your charge controller, you need to put a fuse in line. It's not re you know, required, but recommended. And then from there, we're going to have our battery drop. And then from there, we're going to have our dump load drop, which is optional uh, up to, you know, point once you get past 500 watts, I'd probably have it done regardless. And then at the last point of this, we're going to tie into our 12 volt battery and go right up to our inverter. And that is as simple off grid as you can get with solar. Um, if you don't use complicated components, the sand trace inverter that I passed around, that white one, it has the fins on top, it can get complicated. Like literally the wiring diagram on it is just like a whole page. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So that's why I encourage us to like with those one charge controllers, it's marked. Put your battery in here. Put your dump load here. I mean, it's very simple laid out and it's marked easy. So that's the ones I encourage you to go with. Now, we're going to move on to wind power. And I'm trying to make sure I get Tony about 10 minutes here at the end. This right here is, uh, let's turn this, this, this is one of the new products that's going to be coming to market here very soon, Hurricane Wind Power. That is a lot of power. I mean, when you, when you go to talking about wind, everybody thinks that you've got to have one of these megalithic 5kW wind turbines out in your backyard to make power. What's going to happen is you're going to put that out there, and the only time it's going to make you power around here probably is when you have a tornado come through. But if you do small wind, quality small wind, you can have power all the time. I, I'm making power at the house all the time. I just put the, that new blue one up from a while for a greenhouse. It, it spins all the time. The one on the hill spins all the time. This right here is in the 20 mile an hour wind uh, range and you can be making, you know, 1 kW. Um, it's got a really nice tail fin design on it too. I like this because it's like F-22. Tony wanted to build it kind of like that and one day we were up there at this shop and he was working on first prototype. This one here really looks nice but what I want to spin this and show you we can get away with it is you can see there's three wires coming off right there. Okay. That's three phase power. They're all hot. Okay. Now, what you have to deal with with that is you've got two options. Is option one, which most people, this is the simple way to do it, is uh, there is a little simpler option if you use that charge controller for the smaller man. But there's three slots right there in this rectifier. Then you have two coming off. That makes it to a hot ground at that point. So those three wires come into that as illustrated per there. So that's this. All right? And it's going to come around to everybody. That is a rectifier. And you can see it's on a metal plate. All right? It's good to have that up <coughs> off your board on that plate. Keep it away from it. All right? Because of the heat and everything like that. Protect it. Now, 
if you use the same concept principle that we've done with solar, you can see we only have just a little bit of a gap here to bridge between. Now this is using the concept that we're not installing solar panels at the moment. We're installing wind. Okay. Now I'm going to show you at the very end here that uh, charge controller, because that charge controller has the three slot input for wind, you could just go direct to that charge controller. But for the moment, we're just going to say that you have a small turbine, maybe five, eight hundred watt turbine, and you want to rectify it down and then run it through the charge controller, which Tony's going to go over the difference between all those charge controllers in a minute. So that turbine is producing AC and the rectifier changes it to DC? It, the three phase, and you're going to bring that from industrial three phase down to uh, <coughs> DC. But it is AC current at first. It's alternating back and forth industrial current. Yes. And the, the way that you can slow this down and stop it, you never need to try to stop a wind turbine when it's in motion. Or you might see exciting things flying all over the place. Okay? Is that you can see there's three switches there. Now what I've done with the really small wind power of the house is I've done what is not up to cut. Is I went to Lowe's and I got a UL listed box and I cut down the panel and you can see it in there and I took three AC breakers and I just put them in place and I ran the three wires of the power in over twisted together under this terminal leads. You can see that in the wind turbine build video. When I want to stop my turbine out there, I just go out there and flip three breakers and the thing goes into brake mode. It, that creates an electromagnetic field that it can't, it can't spin like the wind starts cranking and it's like it'll get a good motion and then it's, it stops again. And then you'll see it start to cog again. If that were on right, you could spin it and touch those wires and then the straighters but I think that I think and it's not spinning really, so. Yeah, it's a little tight on there at the moment. But, but yeah, like what Tony's saying is like right now, you can give us a hand crank and it would almost immediately just like stop. You touch those three wires together. Now that is that is a safe way of stopping that, okay? I mean, you can, you can safely stop it that way. And then if, we're, if you do end up wanting to sell the electric company power later, you can always have the disconnect box put in place right beyond that. So that they have the authority to come and disconnect you from selling the power. Now the only problem with that is the day that you ever want to go from making your own power off grid to selling them power, and then you're at their mercy. You know, and so independence people. That's um, why I, uh, I focus on off grid for a business. Now this right here is option two. You can do what I said with a break as long as you have some really hardcore. Uh, heavy duty hamper uh, breakers for industrial use if you're going to use something like this. But at that point, you can see right here that those three wires just go directly into the charge controller. Now that charge controller right there has got these three wires, like I said at the very beginning, this one here has the option to go right direct in. Right there. Like I said, wild AC. Going into that. So that is another option. And with doing that with this type of charge controller, then that leaves that slot one open to do just like I showed you at the very beginning. And all these slides will be available on the video so you can rewatch all this again. Piece by piece. When you flip those switches, would that affect your charge controller at all going to ground? Okay. This right here will not let, from that point forward, there's no power passing there, so it won't hurt your charge controller. All that you'll be getting, feeding at that point, is whatever solar that you've got coming in. So the, the Ground, by grounding it, it doesn't affect. Okay. No, because you're you're not letting anything come beyond that line anymore. Okay. Because all those are tied together. It's uh, in a sense you, you got to look at it. It's, it's not being grounded at all. It's actually joining <coughs> all oh, those wire okay. links into one. I got you. And so the electromagnetic fields just all out of whack at that point. Yeah. Now, at that point, then you've got uh, you've got your wind coming in and you've got your solar coming in. And you've got a balance, which is a great thing to have for some days the wind blows, some days the sun shines, and other days the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine. So it's a good backup option to have right here. Now these top charge controllers right here, just throwing this out there for you, I have um, installed some of these off-grid on some cabinets and stuff. You can, you can use these for solar, 
Um, as far as the wind application goes, I don't personally like how the wiring diagrams laid out for it. I just don't like how they want you to wire that so that that power can just direct feed because these are, you know, pretty much a diversion load controller. That right there handles everything uh, coming and going. And now, the uh, the last point I'd make on it is I would start with solar and give me a little bit of solar because it's a affordable way to get started. And then being that you already have a charge controller and things in that manner, then when it comes time, you want to put your wind turbine up, you're ready to go. It's literally almost just plug and play at that point. Do you happen to know if there are 3D print models for that machine, that, that windmill? 3D print? Yeah. Okay, so. No, I mean, I've built that myself, so I've got, I've got AutoCAD drawings of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Are they, like, available? Are they for purchase? Or? No, I mean, that's my proprietary design. Okay. Something like that. Uh, yes, sir. What's the price on something like this one? What's the, What's the price point going to be on this thing? Eight hundred. Oh, wow. Eight hundred. We didn't hear that. What would be the total price for the whole system installed? And it, it including labor? Yeah. <coughs> how big a system you want? Because that's what it all boils down to. Is how big you want? Yeah. Well, I mean. You know, I mean, like for the one I done the other day, uh, for that tiny house, it was, uh, I think it was 300 watts. He had a uh, pretty decent uh, battery bank put in. Um, just uh, pretty much on level charge control. I think it ran about a thousand bucks. You want the square footage on that one? That was a small. That was that small. One, right? That was 300 watts. Yeah. Three hundred watts. Yeah. Listen, I don't charge by the hour. Like, hey, this is where I can kill people day and night on business. Is I don't charge you. By the hour, I don't charge you by how many days I'm on the job. I just charge you by the wattage. So if you buy 900 watts of solar, you times that by 75 cents, and that's what you'll buy me a check for at the end of the day. Okay. So, so what it don't matter what size charge controller, don't it doesn't matter on any of that. So, and and I found that's working out really good because I got house payments to make. So just hit me up. What kind of uh, permits are required? Okay, yeah, that's where I, that's where I really enjoy the, the niche of all three. Electric companies are evil. Okay. <laughs> if you go to sell them power, let me tell you something. There's a wait list. Well, most of us will be in the grave resting, waiting on the day of the Most High coming back before you'll ever get to sell power to your electric dirty. So you need to really consider off-grid power. Because what's going to happen is whether, you know, you, you, you see things like me as the end days, as far as scripture goes, or whether it's just the next time a snowstorm comes. One day, electric company ain't going to be there. Folks, the power went out in my town the other day. It was a warm spring day. <coughs> Nobody hit a tree or nothing or anything. I mean, it just went out. So, I mean, one day you're going to need, so if you go to a full one electric company, this particular electric company, I'm not going to mention their name. This is just for reference. <laughs> yes, you're going to do Tony, I'm three minutes. I'm wrapping up. Swear to God, I'm ready for you to be broke. Uh, there is a 300 and something dollar fee you will pay for a form that says, I, so and so, will sell you power. Then they're going to charge you $368 just to come out and put an additional meter on the wall that lets them uh, keep an eye on how much power you're selling. Then you got to put a disconnect box in that they can have authority to disconnect you from selling that power at any time at their pleasure. So, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. And the green, uh, TBA Green Power Switch program is practically cut dry right now because what was going on with that is if you uh, finished your system, and you qualify through your electric company, they give you $1,000 back for TVA, just instantly saying thank you for selling this power. So that's pretty much why I've So this. At this point, all you've got left really is the federal income tax, or the federal credit is 30% at the end of the year. They do not give you cash back anymore. I was really excited this tax season. I was like, yeah, we're going to eat some Japanese tonight. <laughs> they said, no, uh, it just comes right off the top of what you owe. So that just, that just pretty much wiped out what I owed in, and I didn't get Jack back. So just so you know, unless you owe, unless you owe cash in to the government, that 30% pretty much is cut and dry thanks to our wonderful politicians nowadays. So I just want to give you a warning about that too. So if you do off-grid though, you can turn that 30% in still, okay? And, and that's labor, that's materials, it's everything. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. If anybody has questions, 
I will be out here in the lobby moving this arsenal back out here in a little while. And before I go, I'll hang out around here 10, 15 minutes, and anybody's got questions, I'll try to answer them. But I'm going to turn it over to Tony right now and let him go over some charge controllers and stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Tommy. I'm in Hurricane One Power, and um, I don't want to do that. Okay, so let me. I see some people taking notes. Let me figure out, let me figure out why we're here. We're not, most of you, most of you got. I saw when I come in the last fellow was hit. I think he had a PowerPoint about talking about the market. Nobody. <coughs> does anybody care about that? No. Not very Most everybody's here taking notes because you want to learn how to, how to do this. Solar what I need is what power builder. Okay, so okay, so let me start out with two things. One, anytime you put any of this stuff up is a business, I start off with telling people if you're gonna put anything in. Mm -hmm. I think um, Lucas was really straightforward about that, but if you do go that route, one, yeah, you know, liability wise, you have to contact them. Secondly, you need to make sure if something, sometimes bad things happen. So, I mean, your homeowner's insurance, if you put any of this stuff up and something bad happens, say none of the components that we sell you fail. Lightning comes back in, bad things happen, and you don't you don't want to be liable for trying to make, make a few watts of electricity. So, you know, first we don't want to cause any harm, and after that we want to do as much good as possible. So, you know, with the 12 volt stuff, um, if as long as you're going to stay off grid and you're going to stay small, 12 volts are completely fine. But you need to remember that formula that I gave you a little bit ago. And keep in mind that if you're going to um, use a lot of power, and, you know, I have people, they'll call and they'll ask me, and they'll say, um, I have I have 2,000 square feet, um, how much power do I use? And I, I can tell you <laughs> that, I hear some of you laughing, but I mean, there's probably somebody back here that anybody Show your hand. Did anybody give me that call? A <laughs> <laughs> well, square foot of a house does not use any power. It depends on how much you got, what you're trying to do. And that being said, um, all of these things that we're passing around, there is a time and a place for all of them. They're just tools. So how many of you, have any of you guys had a wind turbine before? Yeah. Nobody. Okay. If, if it, any of you, so... That's cool. Okay, so I mean that tells me where I'm at. Basically, where the wind turbine business is, if you go to eBay and you go to YouTube, is there are a bunch of guys that are throwing crap back and forth like a bunch of monkeys. Because, I mean, you know, he sucks by for me. And I think that started several years ago, you know, with some advertising and some guys are saying, if you don't buy my stuff, you know, he sucks. And I mean, that's that's really, it's not where we want to be at. But we, with these new designs, um, I saw some of you guys <coughs> checking it out when you come in. That ended up being like, uh, by the time, well, I'm not the biggest wind and solar store in the country. Uh, some of my competitors um, are you? I'm the biggest, I'm not, I don't care. I'm not trying to be Walmart. I'm doing what I do. I do what I do on my shop. And I'm down to earth, I answer the phone, I talk to people like you guys every day. So that leads me to my next point. Do we start talking about MPPT controllers and grid ties and, and fuses and everything under the sun. Do not be intimidated by this because I started exactly, well, I didn't start even where you were starting. I was doing research and I was blowing crap off and I, was, I mean, you know, for, for every one of those, I have, you know how many windmills I've made that didn't work? Somebody take a guess. Uh, I've, I've, they held the first two years I built windmills, nothing. The first thing you have to do to charge a battery with a windmill is the, the voltage of your battery system. If it's 12 volts or if it's 24 volts, um, another question that I get all the time is, 
we will advertise, and we'll say 12 volt windmill, or this is a 24 volt windmill. So people get all sorts of confused about, all that means is, is that the rotation speed, so if the, if the wind were blowing, and um, what this has in it is, if, if you were to peel this away, the girl has some dump bills, blueprint. <laughs> the girl asked about the blueprint. If you were to peel this away, you've got, this is what you call a radial design. And that means that it turns on an axis inside it. It's got windings in a circle. <coughs> it's got magnets that oppose north and south. These are rare earth magnets. Unfortunately, 96% of the rare earth magnets in the world come from China. Okay? And it's not because there's not rare earth anywhere else. It's because that the toxicity of producing this, we have three-eyed fish, and we don't, you know, our EPA. It's kind of a big thing that don't come from you. But nonetheless, um, I was saying this was put together. It, it, it kind of remind me of a reality TV show, 20 hours. I'm cross-eyed. We finish this up and we so this really isn't finished. Uh, this would normally be powder coated, it's not, so uh, the blades aren't really finished. But um, anyway, enough about the windmill. I was, what I was saying is 12 volt system. This thing's rotating. If I do this, 12 volts is not shooting out. The, the voltage incrementally creeps up if you don't have this hooked up to everything. You just let it spin. This might go up to 36 volts. You know, it might go up to 45 volts. Who knows? No, up to that. You know, incrementally in any system, 12, 24, 48, a permanent magnet alternator will increase with, 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 with speed. So, the thickness of the wiring is what depends on um, how high the voltage can be. If you have thinner wire in the winding, it'll make it more voltage. If you have thicker winding, it's more suitable for amplitude. So with that being said, I mean, you know, you guys can improve. This is something that I do for people that don't feel like sitting down and figuring out how to do it yourself. You can go online, and uh, there's a fellow named Hugh Higgett that, you know, you can carve your own wood blades. I've got one on the back of my truck that's five feet long. I built this thing called an axial flux venture. And you can router this out for a stator, and it's one of the most efficient permanent magnet alternator designs in the world. You can build it absolutely by yourself, okay? So, um... There's lots of different kinds of new things. There are different tools. It's, it's a tool. All these things are different tools. There's different tools that are appropriate at different times. If you ever want to rip tie things back, 12 volt is probably not the best choice because most of the UL 1741 approved, which means the evil electrical companies say you have to be most in a lot of cases. That's the case down here, right? UL 1741. So it's very difficult to get a UL 1741 inverter. It doesn't exist in 12 volts. So you need to, you know, out back to 3648, 3524, um, some of those type of things. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the name of the gentleman um, who has the designs? H-U-G-A-T-I-G-G-O-T-T. Thank you. Axial, it's called an axial flux wind turbine. We have a commercial grade one on Okay, thank you. And that, you know, you can do, you can upscale those things. You can literally build a 5K out of the window. Perfect, thank okay. you. Okay, so when Lucas was talking about these controllers, you don't know controllers. Let me go back there real quick. I, I, I feel I'm, I'm running out of time here. Thank you. We were talking about different types of charge controllers. So when you use a diversion mode charge controller, like we had with these, you can use wind, and it's got what is called a pulse width modulation control thing. So every um, charge controller has a charging cycle, it's like the bulb. So the first stage in the charging cycle, it sends a little bit more voltage in there. It's a little hotter. It cleans off the battery plug. Then there's a uh, float, and there's, there's an absorption cycle. So 
when, when he says this is a 70 watt panel, it's 70 watts, but the VOC on the back of this is you're only going to get 5 to 6 amps times whatever your battery's at. So if this is hooked to a 12 volt battery, you're going to get 5.5 times if your battery's at 12.6, which is usually somewhere between 60 and 70.